Home. I stand on an acre of stone and echo, a small beach on the coast of Maine. This morning my father ferried me ashore and left me. Moments from now, home will disappear. Home is three white triangles flaring between evergreen and Atlantic. Home is the fat-bellied vessel beneath the vanishing sails. Home is everything aboard the vessel, butternut tow rails, stainless steel rigging, helm, fiberglass cabin, lockers, and the bright red engine that vibrates the entire hull when ignited. Home is the three people on deck, their sharp footfalls as they carry out the routines for departure and the call and response of their bodies when nothing needs saying. The family aboard doesn't speak about the disappearing shoreline or me, the disappearing girl. By next Monday, I'll have nearly died twice and no one will know. I am 16. I've asked to be left behind. Let me show you myself before I disappear, or at least let me show you the girl I believe I was. Hipless, flat, a body slimmed by confusion, a face trying to grow large enough to balance nose and mouth. A ragged girl, skinned, reddened, hair streaked gold by sun, frame waning towards gaunt. Even though I've asked to be left, I want to see and be seen. I grab binoculars and leap from my shelter. The beach slopes steeply, propelling me towards water's edge. At the top, the rocks have shattered into thin, pale shards, perfect for skipping. The stones roughen and darken as I plunge towards the water. With the tide's lip pulled back, the shore's indigo gums grimace. Dark blue mussels and feasting predators exposed. An orchestra of wet cracks and clacks accompanies my footfalls as the soft, slick organisms click their armor shut. The lenses shorten the, the divide between beach and home, between my body and the dollhouse figurines of my brother, mother, and father. Father, Captain, how small he looks at this distance, him who placed me ashore. He's taught me anyone cast overboard dies. The sentence ricochets about my brain, but it's too late to call out. It's too late to scream or cry. My new abode is a small shaken plywood shack tucked into the coast's deep embankment, its aft end embedded in a cliff, its edifice and tiny porch propped on shaggy cedar stilts. Behind it, miles of pine and nettle. Before it, a deep pocket of ocean, a way station between two worlds. For half the day, the stones are covered by several feet of water. For the other half, they hem the rugged isthmus upon which I've been cast away. There are no photographs of that day, no entries in the ship's log, no words in my journal. What remains is the film that flickers in, in my brain when I smell brine. The shift of the tide summons the afternoon breeze, filling sails and pushing my family towards open water. The last corner of sail slips around the headlands. For the rest of the day, I sit on the narrow porch, dangling my legs over the edge while the tide rises towards me. It's a 10-foot plunge to the rocks below. Bosun, my gribbles labbed, whimpers and paces, sniffing the possessions I've brought with me old and fat and suffering from a mystery illness that rendered him stiff with arthritis, he doesn't sit, he crashes. With a grunt, he puts his head in my lap and leans into the thin comfort of me. I touch his nose, trying to hold the warm, steady whistle of his breath while the tide climbs the house's stilts another inch. Soon I will need to bring us inside, light the lamps, cast flicker into dark. The shadows crawl over me and the sea rises to meet them, but I do not leave the porch until the water brushes the bottoms of my sneakers and for a moment I touch the element that touches home.